Hi, thanks very much for having me. I love Instagram, you know, it's the, the hyper thing is really cool. I've been using it quite a bit, so it was nice to listen to the presentation. So my job today is to talk to you about the future. Um, I lived in the US for 17 years. I'm originally from Germany. I live in Switzerland now. So if I say things that are painful, that's my German part. And if I say things that are interesting or awesome, that's my American part. Many of you may have never actually seen a futurist before, a live futurist. There's people like Alvin Toffler, of course. You may know Ray Kurzweil. What I do is really quite different. Uh, I look at the immediate future. So basically the idea of saying what happens in a very short time, in the next five years. And there's a great saying in China that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. And it's so true because in many ways there's things that we already know that we're not looking at. That's kind of my job is to go backwards from the future. So I'm not into predictions, I'm into foresights. And all of you have foresights, just a question of looking at them. So one foresight, for example, as compared to predicting the future is, you know, I don't talk about flying cars, but I will talk to you about the self-driving car. Right? So much more realistic and short time things. So today's topic is really about what is happening with marketing and advertising in a digital native society. There have in fact been people saying that in a connected world, in a networked society, we don't need advertising. Right? Because the assumption is that whatever we find together is the advertising in itself. Right? So the, the content is actually the ad. Of course, you know we're not quite there yet. You know? We're actually quite far away from this. But the question is, how can we transform, like this car transforms, the advertising marketing business into a new industry? Because in five years, we're going to have five billion people connected to high-speed mobile networks. We're going to have people looking for information by speaking to the computer, by using computer brain interfaces, by having automatic language translation. This is stuff that sounds like science fiction. Right? Just get an app, there's a, a great app. It's called, um, what is it called? <laughs> it's, a, it's a translation app, Say Hi, it's called. Right? If you use Say Hi, you can speak into it, it costs $2, right? You can speak into it and then it will translate into, into 20 languages in real time. That's kind of science fiction, you know? it's a matrix minority report stuff, right? So we're looking at transformation at a really pretty far, fast pace and there's one thing you shouldn't do. You know, I worked in the music industry for a long time. I wrote a bunch of uh, books about music, and most of that was a waste of time. Uh, basically, whatever you do, if you don't do what the music business does, you're, you're pretty well off. The music business essentially faced transformation in 1998 with Napster. And of course, the response was to say, you know what, that may be true, but we won't like it. We're not participating. And then you see what happens on this curve on their revenue streams, a 71% demise of digital music. Now we have Spotify, right? If every person that is connected to the internet would have a Spotify app as part of their mobile phone subscription, the revenues would be twice as big as they were 10 years ago. Right? But of course, you know, this is the question of how we get from A to B. But, you know, needless to say, you can't fax a cat. So if that's your response to the changes, now actually it's funny that in many ways, marketing and advertising agencies are kind of like record labels, right? if you haven't noticed. Because brands can go direct, but in theory, of course, we still need labels, publishers, middlemen, but how? I mean, you've observed, you know, I've written five books. I don't use a publisher anymore, but I would if there was scale to it. The question is, what do they really offer? The question for your clients would be, what do you offer that makes it worth paying you all that money that they used to pay you? So that is a real a serious question about not trying to fax the cat. The same goes for newspapers, for example. Right? Rather than the New York Times, which is trying to force me to pay, in, in this case I'd be happy to pay, but you know, it's a million subscribers for the biggest newspaper in the world. There's hardly a success for what they call the paywall. Right? I mean, that's actually pretty bad for the biggest newspaper in the world, right? And it's not growing. So their approach to the paywall has failed. Right? And, and they have admitted as much just a couple of weeks ago. Right? Five, a five-year process. So Netflix is the opposite, which is a huge debate about Netflix in Australia, I just noticed, right? about when it's coming and all the people using it with VPNs, which is a great way to watch Netflix. Um, we have to think about pay will, not paywall. Right? The question that we have to ask ourselves is how will people pay for sure 
rather than how can we make them pay? Because you can almost never make somebody pay on the internet, in the digital world. You can make me pay for the computer or the car, right? Because you cannot yet make a digital copy of that. But for media, content, information, data, right? it's about pay will, not pay wall. Because now we're moving into what has been called in many ways an exponential society. It's kind of hard to understand because people aren't exponential. You know, we count one, two, three, four, five, and you know, we don't live faster or move faster or have more hours in our day just because we have mobile phones. We can have 150 people in our tribe. That's kind of the social amplification that we can have. We cannot have 15,000. Right? We're, we're linear. But technology is exponential. So we're seeing the change from the past few years has come up with stuff that you would not have believed just five years ago. This year in November, Microsoft will roll out live translation in Skype. Right? So you can talk in Chinese and listen to it in like 40 languages in real time. Right? That's exponential technology. So if you're thinking about your business, don't think linear. This will be deadly. The advertising business and the marketing business and the branding business is subject to this exponential scale of technology. So basically, most of that is about data, as we've heard many times today. Because basically, data and artificial intelligence, which I'll talk more about shortly, and the Internet of Things and automation will revolutionize how we do things. Sometimes in bad ways, sometimes in good ways, but you know, this is kind of what we get with technology. We're now at the takeoff point. We're at four, and the next step isn't five, it's eight. And after that is 16 and so on. And this is about every 16 to 18 months. So uh, Hemingway has a great quote on this. He says, how does a person go broke gradually, then suddenly? Right. So all the stuff we're talking about today, we've heard that 1996, in the beginning of the internet. I was part of that, you know, the evangelism of how the web will change everything. And we talked about Spotify type music like water, right? 1999, how long did it take? 15 years. But if you're assuming that today we're at the beginning of this, we're not. We're actually shortly before that takeoff point. This gradually, then suddenly, we're beyond the gradually now. We're approaching the suddenly point. And this will happen with advertising, it will happen with media. For example, if you see what happens with all kinds of media online, it's a total margin reduction. I mean, on Kindle, you can now get a flat rate for books. I think it's about two million books. So I used to buy a printed book for, what, $20? Then I buy a Kindle book for $12. Now I buy a subscription for $10. What is the next thing? I get paid to read. Right? <laughs> I don't know, something like that. But it's ultra efficient. What does it do to the writer? Well, the writer hopes to get a larger audience. Right? Netflix, $30 DVD. Netflix, $10. Right? No wonder the studios don't want this. Hyper efficiency. And you're subject to the same rules of the market. Technology brings hyper-efficiency. That's the bad news, right? the German news. It reduces traditional margins. And there's nothing we can do about that. We can't, you know, we can sort of try to delay it, like the record labels did, not be part of it, sue people for non-compliance. Right? But in the end, you know, Netflix just sent me an email a couple of weeks ago. They hiking the price, but they let me continue with what I started paying through a VPN, by the way, uh, two years ago. I pay more for the VPN than I pay for Netflix. I mean, isn't that ironic? I pay more for the how-to than for the content. I mean, whoever thought of that strategy as far as the content owners is concerned right, should be going cleaning some toilet somewhere rather than think about the future of their company. Right? Bad idea. So here's two curves to remember to dream about tonight. The first curve, life and technology is changing exponentially. Who would have thought of self-driving cars? You know, five years ago, I did a seminar for Volkswagen, and I told them that we're looking towards electric cars, shared cars, and the biggest trend in cars is not to have one, really. Not in Australia, I don't think, but in general. Right? So it's exponential. We have to start thinking exponentially. The second one is the valley of death. And that means, as technology is changing your business, 
the future is actually pretty bright because you will have five billion people connected to media, to mobile tablets, to high streaming fast networks, right? to direct marketing options, to data streams. That sounds like a nirvana. Right? And in fact, it is. In five years, we have that. But today, we don't. Right? Today, we're stuck with that old stuff. Like in Australia, you can't even connect in many places, right, when you go outside of the big cities. You don't have the, I think 91% of Australians aren't actually covered in 3G. Right? Well, if, if you don't live in the cities, I suppose. So there is the gap, the value of death. So if you're an agency, for example, you're going to see this value of death because the past has sort of started winding down and the future isn't quite here. So you need to build a bridge or pack water, or get rid of people, right? So you have more resources. I think, however, that the glass is half full, not half empty. So we have this temporary thing, you know, for example, in the publishing business, clearly if you have a, a, a newspaper or a magazine, or even worse, a bookstore, or, or, or God, God forbid, a radio station, right? You, you're going to face that value of death. Right? So the future, however, I think is a glass half full. It's also very interesting that the future brings what has been called many times abundance. There's a book with that name by Peter Diamantis, I recommend you read. Basically, music, right? Eight million songs on Spotify, Netflix, one million movies or something like this. Amazon, endless books. The next thing is education, Coursera and all these companies, abundance. And then with 3D printers, I can print my tennis shoes. Abundance of cars, zip car, car sharing, you name it, right? Abundance. We have many carrots we can choose from. So here's a question for you as a marketer. How in the world will you be the carrot they pick in this abundance? I mean, this is the key challenge, right? And the answer is, you're not going to do it the old way. You're not going to do it in the way of making noise or building fancy mousetraps. Mousetraps include what we have today, many digital offerings, right, which are essentially capturing my information to give me some free service. Kind of a Faustian bargain, you could say. So how do we do this, right? It means that we have to figure out how we survive in, in, in fragmentation, in niches, how we'll survive that brands will go direct, just like everyone else. I mean, the examples are here, right? On Twitter and LinkedIn, this is the, the global HR resource now. You want a new, new job, you go on Twitter. You go on LinkedIn. You don't go to an agent. Filmmakers go to Amazon, YouTube. Google now predicts what's going to happen throughout your day. You know what they're going to do there, of course. Feed that with customized advertising that looks like it's actually in your brain. They have the data. Right? If you haven't tried Google now, you should because it will, it will tell you something about where we're going with going direct. You may have seen the movie Her. Right? Technology is becoming actually intelligent. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Because when I watched it with my son, who was 19, he said, well, this is not much different than what we have today. Right? We fall in love with our mobile devices. Now we fall in love with our operating system. You know, same thing, really. Right? So now we're actually intelligent. And it's kind of funny to see that technology used to be very dumb, you know, try theory or Google Translate, you know, you only get garbage back, really. But now, you can tell Siri to book a hotel for you. So the challenge is, this will completely change media advertising, marketing and branding. Imagine a moment just two or three years from now, when a 50-year-old guy looks for a restaurant, he speaks to his computer, the computer knows exactly where he's been, or the mobile, of course, mostly a mobile, really, right? Can synchronize all the information, make a recommendation, book the place, invite the friends all in one go through what's called artificial intelligence. Right? If you're banking on search in the future, you can write that off in about two or three years because search will no longer work then. If I can speak to the computer, I can say anything I want. I don't have to type. If you haven't spoken to your computer, give it a try. See how that changes the way that you use an interface. So Peter Diamantis again calls this the exponential organization. This is what you have to become. Whether you're a brand on the client side or whether you're 
an advertising agency or just a person, you have to become an exponential organization. You should read this book. It's, there's lots of stuff in there I don't agree with, but the theme is very good, right? We have to become an exponential organization. Because, you know, the old way of advertising and marketing like this, you know, essentially a bidding war for eyeballs, right? that's not intelligent. It can be intelligent in some instances, right? but by and large, the system isn't intelligent. Right? Right? It's, it's basically a hit or miss. It's a watering can. And CPM, same thing. It's a watering can. I mean, we heard about Instagram and Facebook and all that. This is, this is the difference, right? The watering can versus a targeted audience. Mark Anderson from Netscape said, software is eating the world. He said this 15 years ago. And it's so true. And look around yourself, software everywhere. Right? Sentiment analysis, recommendations. Right? I mean, everything we hear about here is software, basically. Right? Everything is turning into software. Television is now software. Controlling your home environment and energy now. You can do that with an app, like through Nest. Everything that can will become software, including humans. Right? The analysis of, of data and facts, software does that now. I'll talk about that shortly because it has impact on our job. Again, this idea of gradually then suddenly, the transfer of value from actual people and incumbent organization to software. I mean, if you're looking at Salesforce, right? or Xero, X-E-R-O, the bookkeeping software from New Zealand, that's not about people, that's about intelligent software. Right? And people are sitting on top of that, so my, my accountant has to use this, but half his job is gone. Because now he has to be on top of this intelligent software. And the same thing has happened to television, right? Everybody wants a slice of television using intelligent software. And television guys are lucky because now basically the internet and television are converging. It's becoming the same thing. So it's great for them because they can have it both ways. It's actually a very good future there. But uh, I call this sometimes cloud vision rather than television because now all television is in the cloud. Very soon the uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation is just an app on your whatever you're using to watch. There's no default. It's all in the cloud. The Google self-driving car, this is the latest rendition of it, clearly shows where we're going. And if you can watch the YouTube video, it's quite interesting to see how people react to it. This is the safest car ever made. The consequence of this would be eventually that we're not going to be allowed to drive anymore because this car is safer. Definitely safer. Like pilots, same thing, right? If we can get over this idea that there has to be a person, the machine is going to be safer to fly us, which is a kind of a strange thing, right? Everybody kind of knows that, but nobody wants to look at it. So the result of this is another sort of Darwinistic statement, which actually I think is good for us. Everything that can be automated will be automated. That goes along with the software, right? Same thing. Google now automates making my day safe by anticipating what is going to happen next. By prediction. Same idea. So advertising, marketing, and media tops the list to be automated. And I think that's a good thing. Because what happens here is that the machine intelligence can do all these things that we use to painfully count and figure out so that we can focus on the part that's on top, reading between the lines, creativity, intuition. It's a great saying by a French philosopher, uh, Poincaré, who says that uh, logic, proof, logic proofs intuition discovers. Right? And your job is not the logic. Right? The logic was the job. Right? There is some of that left in the future, but intuition discovers. Because now we have this, right, basically quite clearly so that software and technology can do this. Right? It's the thing that we have to face, and when we look at jobs, for example, there's been lots of research from Oxford University. In the next 10 to 20 years, 58% of financial advisors replaced by artificial intelligence. And here's a list of jobs that you don't want to have in the future. And on top of that list is telemarketers. Oxford report says, depending on the country and where, and where exactly you live, 
between 45 and 65 percent of all jobs will be eliminated by technology. And then it also says we're looking at roughly between 50 and 70 percent of jobs that haven't even been invented yet. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Your kids will have jobs that we have no idea that even exist today. You know, the most sought for after job these days is a data scientist or a privacy engineer. Those are weird jobs that nobody even knows what that means, right? But if you have that job, then you consider yourself lucky. The storytelling that you do in advertising and marketing becomes supported by smart machines. For example, this company, Narrative Science, writes articles for Forbes magazine. Roughly 10% of all Forbes magazine articles are written by software. Of course, anything that's not really a story, that's more like a fact collection. Right? No sentiment, no judgment. Exactly what journalists were not supposed to do in the past. So if you want to read a book that talks about what's happening here, you should read a friend of mine, Rita McGrath. She's a, a professor at Columbia. She has a new book called The End of Competitive Advantage. And that is where you're at. The competitive advantage of having information, right, of having access, of bundling media planning, right, that was a competitive advantage, a scale. Right? That is eroding, and she talks about what's happening here in this sort of new way of do, doing things. She talks about how we are looking towards transient advantages. Your windows. You know, you take a window, you continue, the next window comes out, right, because of technology. If you're a bank today, is your building really a competitive advantage? The answer is, who cares about a bank and a building, right? Banking is necessary, banks are not, is what Bill Gates said 10 years ago. I'm not sure I would agree, but do you need a building for that? Not really. So she talks about that we have to think more like an arena. You know, what arena are we in? Of course, this is what all big advertising agencies and companies in that field are trying to do for quite some time, to figure out what is next to the job. Right? So it's no longer about creativity, just also about technology, about sociology, about understanding. Right? And this is an interesting um, piece from her book, where she talks about what's happening with arenas, essentially, just to zoom in on this, right? It's about capturing territory, the share of potential opportunity, and inter-industry inter moves. It's a different world. Right? It's an arena thinking. Uh, blue ocean, right? we talked about this morning, same idea. Because if we're looking at, at the reality of what's happening with uh, advertising spending, this is US now, complete convergence of TV and digital. Right? I mean, you already know this, but really what this means is that we're converging what I call broadbanding and broadcasting. So as soon as people are ubiquitously connected, they become what I call broadbanders. They change their behavior. Yeah, it's hard to be connected every time, everywhere, and to depend on the cloud, but really what this means is we have to get out of this silo, thinking as to what you do. This is very important also, of course, for your clients. So you can make a lot more use of the network effect of technology. There was a session about LinkedIn earlier. I mean, if you're looking at the stats of LinkedIn, mind-boggling, right? I was number 8,000 on LinkedIn. When I started inviting people to LinkedIn, everybody said, what in the world are you doing? I don't want to connect with strangers. I get like 500 requests a day now. Right? And this is what's happening, is the network effect. And LinkedIn is building what they call the economic graph of work. They're going to restructure how work and jobs are being done in the future using smart technology. Could you do the same in the ad business? Yeah, absolutely. You could use network effects, and you have to. Because all the companies that use network effects, right, you know where they go? They don't go like this. Right? They go like this or like this. Right? They either die or they explode. Disruptive innovation not just sustaining innovation. That's what we're looking for. Right? I mean, all these companies here, all the things that are happening in this context, open source creative resources, technology companies going into the advertising space, virtual agencies. Again, a lot of that kind of sounds like science fiction. Right? This is all becoming very real very quickly. So now we're living in a pretty crazy world. I mean, if you're looking at all the stuff, that's on this chart here. 
you sort of have to be a geek or an academic or somebody who's, you know, maybe a futurist to understand what all this stuff actually means. The Internet of Things, big data, cloud computing. This is becoming an everyday conversation now. And here's what would happen with advertising, right? In the end, you know, as uh, Peter Diamantis says, continued acceleration of exponential technologies riding on top of Moore's law. Moore's law is just the law of computing increase, right? And all these areas are areas that will impact your daily work in the advertising marketing business. So that's something you look at, you know, when you get home, think about the Internet of Things. Think about this sort of hybrid role that's coming. And I believe that in this world, we cannot compete with machines. We lose that battle. We're not going to be quicker, smarter, remember more stuff. I mean, a doctor having access to IBM's Watson when he's making the rounds in a cancer hospital, he can pull up 158,000 cases of cancer. How much does he remember? Two, three. We can't compete with machines. But machines cannot compete with us at all on social intelligence, emotional intelligence, right? Creativ creativity, not for a while at least. Uh, we'll see when that happens. Economists talked about this, you know, the rise of robots, and this is not just machine robots, but also software robots. Right? That clearly is going to happen. And in a way, this has been referred to in the past as hell then, hell and heaven. It could be heaven for you guys if you're into marketing, having all that data and automation and smart software that can cut it down from 100 people to three who run the machine, so to speak, is fantastic. Right? I mean, it's this data stream that is heaven. Right? Can be hell in many other ways, of course, including you know, basically becoming enslaved by technology, as many of us are addicted to it. Right? So I have to see where that goes. You know, we think we're in charge of it, but it's many ways in charge of us. And the Internet of Things is the next step of this. This cartoon kind of shows what happens when everything is connected, you know, basically talking about you. Your refrigerator knows when you came in. You know, the Internet of Things basically illustrates all of these things that we have been doing before, but magnifies it, right? This will have a huge impact on, on marketing. I mean, if you have all that information, if you know that the fridge is empty, can you send a coupon? Yeah, well, that's the whole idea of it, right? That's why Google bought Nest. They know what your energy use is so they can recommend the product. And it's a direct interface. There's nothing in between. So this is business intelligence at warp speed. And that's really what you want, of course, right? But, of course, there are drawbacks to this whole idea of the Internet of Things. Yeah. And we're looking at this kind of development that in 1765 we invented an engine for the body. That was James Watt and the steam engine, right? So we could move quicker or generate heat or take a train. That was a long time ago. Now we have an engine for the brain. Same thing, right? That's been referred to as a second industrial revolution, or the third industrial revolution, actually. An engine for the brain. And that's kind of inevitable. Right? But here's to keep in mind, you know, just because I have an engine for my brain where I can tap into information through Wikipedia doesn't mean I should implant it, for example, or become what's called a cyborg, essentially. Right? We're looking at a future a like this, you know, this is Apple's new watch. One device you can that is essentially my outsourced brain. It can track a so rather than knowing that I don't walk enough, able to collect my wristwatch tells me. It uses an I'm outsourcing to my thinking to this device. So a big trend in advertising and marketing is artificial intelligence, which is really, most simply put, is emulating human capabilities. Right? Understanding what is being said, done semantic understanding. So if you ask Siri, do you love me, she will answer a bunch of times, but the third time she'll say, you know, why, why do you ask this stupid question? I'm a machine, right? She knows. So this will really change what you can do with advertising. Because clearly that's going to be the path forward, you know, having some sort of way of having prediction it actually becomes possible, right? What's been referred to as precognition. Now this is the holy grail of marketing, of course, that you can actually do that. Foresight. So now we're moving into a world that's this, right? Basically a world of screens. I mean, I was in a taxi in Hong Kong about four weeks ago 
and the guy had like seven screens on his windshield. Couldn't hardly look out. Because right? it's all about screens now. Right? It's all about how they interact a world of screen always on mobile social. And that's where everything is going. 80% of internet traffic in five years will be mobile. Today we're sitting here and saying, oh, mobile advertising is what, 2% of the budget or something? Well, you know what's going to happen here. Clearly, we're seeing this trend towards a world that is based on mobility, on screenification, and on being intelligent. Right? Because these systems are actually, they know us. As scary as that may sound. And we're going inside of this technology, and technology is going inside of us. Which that last part I wouldn't like, but a lot of people are talking about this. You know, Google Glass, in a way, is the same idea. And I have this information there. It's becoming part of me. Imagine what would happen if you're using that Apple Watch and it's able to read where you are, who you are, where you've been. It can present products to you directly. Right? And we're talking about stuff that is completely synchronized and wanted and desired, right? not just some garbage, right? some interruption. Of course, that's what Apple wants to do. That's what Google wants to do, to reach us all directly. So to summarize, you've heard this before. You know, data is the new oil. It's been said, I don't know, 55 years or something. <laughs> but we're going from big oil to big data. The oil economy is roughly $7.5 trillion a year. The data economy, McKinsey says, in five years, will be worth over $11 trillion. One trillion of that is marketing and advertising, roughly. So that is clearly going to be something that we have to look at, you know, being able to really see through things. But let's not, you know, this is really science fiction because we can only see all the way up down to the legs or something, but not all the way through because we don't have omniscience, you know. We cannot get there with data, but we, we can see clearly everyone and everything is becoming a source of real-time data. And there are huge privacy implications with this, clearly. As I said earlier, it's hell then, you know, it's heaven if you want all that stuff. If you're the NSA or a marketer, this is good. Right? It's not the same thing, though, just, to, just comparing. Right? So as uh, Socrates said, nothing vast enters the life, lives of mortals without a curse. So that's something we have to keep a good eye on, because what's happening here, for example, in a product like Google now, all of these things are being fed together. Right? It's free but they sell you information. That's kind of the whole idea of, of this uh, Faustian bargain. And now what we're seeing in the consumer space is the people formerly known as consumers, as I call them, they will soon question this Faustian bargain. As we're seeing now discussions about Facebook and what do I get for my data? And is it really safe? Right? Do they actually keep it safe? Where can I opt out? So the worst thing we can do in the marketing business is to abuse that relationship of data. And of course, needless to say, this is happening pretty much across the uh, spectrum. Uh, as this cartoon says, uh, in the beginning of the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. 2013, everybody knows you're a dog. Right. Again, that's good or bad. But clearly, media and marketing based on surveillance has no future. Remember that. I think this is the most important piece of my presentation. If we abuse the possibility of getting this information, that's like abusing your relationship to figure out a way through the back door for an unintended purpose. Inviting your friends for dinner and charging them on the way out. Bad idea. So that's something we have to keep in mind. This is actually a good thing, for example, what happened with the European Commission. That said that you have a right to be forgotten. This is good for marketing. It's good because it keeps us honest. It keeps us on our feet to figure out how we're going to create value rather than be abusive. Because in the end, we have to strike a balance between creepy and clueless, right? Clueless marketing is the watering can. You know, hit whatever you can. It worked for a long time, but in the future, will not. Creepy marketing is to know exactly everything you've never told anyone. Like many people are saying, Google knows me better than my wife. Right? And it's true, because of all the stuff I typed into it. Never told my wife about my fungus nail or something, you know, just kidding. So between creepy and clueless, there's a big difference. In the future, we're going to need both of those things 
we're going to need what I call awesome humanity, because in the end, selling, marketing, talking about products is an emotional procedure, as we see on this, on this hit map of what people actually want, you know, trust, fear, excitement, anger, disgust. And the rest of it is amazing technology. But here's the secret. If you only do one of the two, you're dead. Because that's not how it works. Those are actually two pieces of the puzzle that we have to both understand. So this is something that we really have to look at because in the end, this kind of what I call machine thinking is not going to get us anywhere. Right? Because people don't buy things because of facts. So the future for agencies is not to be a machine thinker because in the end, you're looking at this, uh, at this cartoon here about social media, in the end, culture does eat technology for breakfast. That doesn't mean we can ignore technology, of course, not at all. Right? It's sort of we have to be dualistic in this approach as to how we go into the future. Let me talk about the future of agencies and then I'll wrap up. We're living in a world that the military calls VUCA. That's a very good term to remember because that is our everyday challenge. Right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. That is because the world is becoming totally interconnected. What we do here impacts those people over there. It's like a giant puzzle. And it's very hard to dominate. And ask the record labels. They, they were looking to dominate. It didn't work. Right? You cannot dominate in a world that's completely interdependent. Some people try, and Apple has done a very good job at that, you know, with their cult. You know, I love Apple stuff, but that is what it is. Right? So the future of agencies, if you're looking at this graph here, the cost to launch an internet tech startup this is a chart from Peter Diamantis again, going towards zero, basically. You think all the stuff that we're doing cannot be done by software partly and by somebody who's inventing some smart technology? And look at all of the examples. From Napster to Spotify, from, uh, from bookkeeping to zero, from, from CRM to Salesforce, and on and on and on, cloud computing, brings that to zero, right? Our response has to be to flip the VUCA. Velocity, unorthodoxy, collaboration, and agility. Here's an example of what that looks like. response to the train was not to freak out and not do anything there, right? but to adapt and to go back and forth. When the train is gone, this is in Thailand, Bangkok, they put the market back together, and then the next train comes 40 minutes later, they do the same thing in reverse, right? They are agile, they are quick, they are unorthodox, they collaborate. And that's kind of what's happening to us. There's always going to be some other train coming through. We have to figure out how to live under the train, right? and around the train. Great pyramid here by IBM, talking about how they perceive the future. This is really about social, emotional, technological, and human intelligence. All of those combined. Because if it was only about technology, then we'd be living inside of a giant machine, which may happen but hasn't happened yet, right? So our work is moving up from this idea of data and information and knowledge to what I call, you know, essentially wisdom and intelligence. And, of course, creativity is part of that. Anything else will be commodity. In the music business, listening to music is a total commodity. It's like water. You don't monetize music. You monetize everything around the music. The interface, the design, the sharing, the playlists, all of the other stuff. That's why it's foolish to say that it's just about distribution of media. It's not. It's about meaning, right? It's about relevance. And a uh, great quote here from Kevin Kelly, co-founder of Wired Magazine. Machines are for answers, humans are for questions. Your job is not to be a better machine. And it, believe me or not, I've seen a lot of stuff in the last 20 years where I believe people work like machines, like robots. And they thought it was a value <laughs> to be robotic and to be efficient. Right? But it's not. It's no longer because machines will take over that part. 
Our job is the right brain, subjective reasoning, imagination, negotiation, all of the stuff that machines can't yet do. And that is the value of your agency or of whatever branding you do for your company. Let me summarize. What you're looking for here is exponential transformation. And that is a question you have to ask both yourself personally as well as where you work. Because that is the key question. That's what's going to happen in the next five years. It's going to be so wildly exponential that you think you live in Disneyland, right? In fact, Disneyland now has a wristband that is connected to the internet that gives you all the coupons and stuff through an online connection. Right? They are already living in the future. So just to summarize a couple of resources, you should read these books to get ready for this exponential future. There's Rita's book, The End of Competitive Advantage. The Second Machine Age, which talks about technology, zero marginal cost, exponential organizations, and abundance. You can download this whole thing from my website later, the whole slides, so you don't have to actually remember this, and you can use your outside brain to capture this. Futuristgerd.com is my website. GERD like gastrointestinal reflux disease, same thing. Right. Futuristgerd.com. And if you want to know more about this, I have a TV show called The Future Show, futureshow.tv, thefutureshow.tv, where you can watch five-minute episodes about all the stuff that's happening. So thanks very much for your time. I, I hope I didn't go on too long because we you know, we're facing lunch, which is...